All right, the right hand side, I haven't done anything to it, but I do need to rewrite it because I'm one step away from doing this comparison of the real and imaginary bits that we were talking about before, okay? Hmm. See this? See this here? I actually have a definition for that, right? This guy here, I defined it on our very first line right here. Do you remember that? I, don't, I still don't know what A and B are, but I can at least put them in place because then I can do a comparison of real and imaginary parts. So let's go ahead and do that. I've got this I hanging out the front. Some of you, the gears are turning, which I'm glad for, okay? Let's just do the substitution, okay? So I'm gonna put in um, A of X plus I B of X, whatever those happen to be. A of X plus I B of X. There we go, there's the left hand side, here comes the right hand side. A dash plus I B dash, okay. Now, thankfully I can like, oh great, arithmetic, I can do this, I'm multiplying some stuff by I. Aren't I, right? And this is where I can start to see which is the real part and which is the imaginary part. Hopefully you can see if I uh, highlight it here, right? The real part's gonna come from these two together. Does that make sense? You've got an I at the front, whoopsie daisy, and you've got the I that was already attached to this B of X. So I times I by definition, minus one, minus one. very good. So you've got minus B of X. That's the real part. Yeah, you with me? And then the imaginary part just comes from the other bit, right? I times that, so it's I times A of X. One more time for good measure, I'll write this. Okay, we finally have real and imaginary on the left, real and imaginary on the right. So now I'm ready to do my comparison. Let's do the real bits first. Real, real, yeah? Let's just jot that down. Uh, I'll keep it in red, actually. Um, from the real comparison, I get that there's, there's some function, a dash, that if I differentiate it, you get minus b. Hmm. Um, and then I have a look at the imaginary part. <clears throat> uh, wrong color, sorry. I think this is the one that I have. Here it is. And here it is. Can you tell me what, what are the bits that I'm going to write together when I say the imaginary part, what's equal to what? B dash yeah, okay, so B dash of X. I mean, you could write it from either side, really, but that's going to be equal to A of X, cool. Hmm. Now, remember, my, my goal, I introduced this notation, this weird notation, A of X, B of X, because I didn't know what they were, right? In some ways, this is a little bit like what we did at the, like in year seven or a bit earlier with algebra. You're like, oh, there's some number. I don't know what it is. I'm just going to give it a name call it X, call it N, and then I can start to do stuff with it. Even when you don't know what it is, you can still manipulate it, okay? And that's exactly what we've done with this notation. There's some function. Don't know what it is, but I can manipulate it. This is my end point, and this is where we just need to think and have this beside, who conveniently, these graphs that we're just having a look at here, right? We're trying to think of two functions, A and B. Two functions, A and B. Uh, I'm actually going to start here. When you differentiate one function, you get to the other. But then if you differentiate this guy, you, you come back to the original function, but with a minus sign, right? Now this is kind of weird because, well, we thought about, I'll write it down again. We thought about things like this, right? x squared plus one to the power of five. Okay. Now, if you did have a death wish and you expanded this thing out, you would have a polynomial where the biggest power would be what? Have a look at it. It'd be 10, wouldn't it? It'd be x to the power of 10, and then it'd be some x to the power of 9, 8, 7, etc. Right? Now, when you differentiate it, when you differentiate it, you end up with something, and its biggest power is not 10, it's 9. And if you did it again, you'd get something with the biggest power of 8, and then 7, and so on. Right? So, in, order, in other words, when you keep on differentiating, the powers go down, 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 down. This can't be that, right? Because you differentiate 1. Then you differentiate again, you kind of come back to where you started. Hmm. So there's kind of like this loop happening, right? Now remembering that derivatives are about gradient, I now want you to look, stare really hard at those three graphs I asked you to do at the start. Let's look at sine x. Here's sine x, okay? What can you tell me about its gradient? Well, uh, it starts off positive, doesn't it? it? Starts off positive. At this point here, right, so that's pi on two, right? At this point here, what can you tell me about the gradient of sine x? 
it's zero, isn't it? Because it's stopped being positive, it's about to be negative, but at this point it's zero. And then for like this middle portion, it's negative, we goes down the slide, right? And then the final portion here, the gradient, comes back to being positive. Yeah? Positive, zero, negative, zero again, positive. Doesn't that sound and look a whole lot like cosine? Do you see that? Here's cosine, it's positive, then it's negative, then it's positive again. So if you differentiate sine, and we can actually prove this rigorously rather than just look at a picture. I told you this was an informal proof, right? When you differentiate sine, you end up in cosine. What happens when you differentiate again? Here's cosine, right? Well, this part's negative, isn't it? Like, do you see it sliding down? I'm thinking about gradient now, right? It's, gr it's negative, it's negative, it's negative. At this point here, gradient zero, it's flat again. And then positive, 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 positive. Doesn't this look familiar too? Do doesn't this look exactly like negative sine? Do you see that? Do you see what's happening? This guy's negative, just like this gradient is negative. This part is positive, just like this gradient is positive. Are you with me? So therefore, we can actually say the only two functions that we know that will actually fit this, the characteristics that we want is that b of x, this has to be sine of x, right? Because when you differentiate this guy, right, you will get to a, which we've just determined should be cos, right? I don't know why I drew these brackets here, right? But then when you differentiate cos again, you don't come back exactly to sine, you come back to the upside down version of sine. Do you see that? So sine and cosine are that mystery a and b that I was after. So can we tie this all up in a neat bow, right? I don't need these graphs at last. They have served their purpose. I'm gonna go back to that very original line. I'm gonna say, well, if e to the i x, this guy here, equals this function a plus an imaginary this function b. I'm just gonna put in the a and b I just worked out. And it should look creepily familiar. <laughs> This is what we get. This equation here, put a big box around it, and I want you to give it a name. This equation here is called Euler's formula. We're gonna do a lot of work with Euler's formula. As you can see, it's a really important result because it connects some really weird ideas, right? But most importantly for us today, I want to make sure that you connect this with what we already know, right? Um, see this right-hand side, cos x plus i sine x? We're clearly in complex number land, right? Because there's an i here, but we don't usually write this guy on the right-hand side in this form. We're used to thinking of this thing here that goes into cos and goes into sine. We would call that the, starts with an a, it's the what of the complex number. It's, it's the argument, isn't it? So to sort of remind us that it's an angle, we usually write it as a theta. Do you remember that? Right? This is how we introduced polar form. Well, if I've changed these x's into thetas, then I guess I should change this x also into a theta. Is that okay? That makes sense? But then, last step. Um, this, is, this is good. Uh, you know, the argument, any argument that I like, I can put into here. But complex numbers don't just have an argument that tells you where the complex number is. What's the second piece that you need to know? You need to know a modulus, right? An R. So, that's actually really easy to fix. I just have to take this whole thing, multiply both sides by ah, that modulus. So I don't even need to change my line. I'm going to just put it in a different color like so. If I multiply both left and right hand side by r, I'm going to put it here. There's the right hand side. And then here is the left hand side. <sighs> take a breath. What have we just done? What have you done? Um, we started off thinking about complex numbers as um, you just put together a real and imaginary bit. And then we sort of went into, we went into trig territory, right? Polar form. We've got a rectangular form, we've got a polar form, but now we also have one third and final form. I'm like, <laughs> my boys, this is really weird because I was like this almost when I was their age, but my boys are really into Pokemon. So if you wanna think about like the evolution of like some, I don't know, like it's, look at my Squirtle, he's turned into a Blastoise, okay? This is what we call, not rectangular form, not polar form, 
What do you think would be a reasonable name for this? Exponential form. And this guy here, I know we were talking um, a couple of lessons back about like, oh man, I hate writing R cos theta plus I sine theta. It takes forever. It's so long. Can we abbreviate in this some way, right? And I said to you, just wait. If you would like a succinct way to write a complex number, this is it, OK? So we are going to spend some time um, exploring what this thing can do and what it's good at. Um, and you'll be relieved, um, having introduced uh, sorry, rectangular, polar, and exponential form, there are no more forms. We're not going to pull like a rabbit out of hats. Like there's a, there's a fifth and a sixth. And a there are three forms of complex numbers. This is the last one. In many ways, it's kind of the coolest, but we'll get to that later. 